NPR Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 7 p.m. Stay tuned for Humankind. Humankind is produced in association with WGBH Boston and supported by the Humankind Program Fund and the Henry Luce Foundation. My experience was that parenting taught me so much. It challenged me so much. It made me realize how selfish I was. And I kept feeling that God or the divine, the spirit, was working through these experiences of parenthood, that it really was a spiritual path for me. Parenting as a fount of life lessons in patience, wonder, and knowing when to let go. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. Many parents raise their children in a particular spiritual tradition. They often hope to transmit a set of moral values, a way of seeing the world to the next generation. But it's not just the children who embark on a remarkable life curriculum. Their parents, too, are continuously being taught by the often exhausting, sometimes exasperating, and frequently magical syllabus of raising the kids. In Philadelphia, Quaker author Eileen Flanagan published a provocative essay for parents titled God Raising Us. I wrote the essay because I felt that I hadn't really read anything about parenthood as a path to exploring all the things that we talk about in spirituality, of connecting with God, of learning humility, of learning things like patience. Just the experience of parenting these children was so full of growth for me um, that it felt like that God was indeed giving me all these lessons through the child who wouldn't be quiet when I wanted her to or through the child who decorated the white carpet with pink sidewalk chalk, (laughs) that these were actually very growth-filled experiences for me, and that was what I wanted to share. Hard to see that in the moment, though? Oh, yes. (laughs) Not necessarily easy in the moment, which is why I thought it was important to put some of the stories together and see the bigger picture. So you feel that you were kind of being trained in, in the difficult discipline of patience through these experiences? Yeah, patience is not my strong suit, never has been. Uh, And that was just one of the things that I felt really tested in as a parent, especially of young children, but even still sometimes as the parent of two teenagers now, that it was an opportunity for me to grow in ways that were challenging that I didn't really have to do when I was a single 20-something who could pretty much do things on my own schedule. With her husband, Tom, a social worker, Eileen Flanagan has raised two healthy, energized teenagers at their home known for its colorful flower display out front in the East Falls section of Philadelphia. Their daughter is down-to-earth and independent-minded, their son an athlete and creative spirit, but in any family, bringing up children provides a blend of delightful surprises and occasionally vexing moments, and the challenges can present a spiritual opportunity. The parent must decide when it's time to assert control and when the wiser choice is giving up a bit of personal independence. Yeah, in a lot of ways, starting with pregnancy, uh, my first child, my daughter, was two weeks after her due date. And I'm a, I'm a very punctual person. I like things to happen when they're supposed to happen. And here was this child not coming on time right from the get-go. And it turned out to be what was best. I broke my arm right before my due date and in the end was really grateful that she took her time in coming. But that was really when I started thinking about the serenity prayer as a guide for life, that there are some things we can control and we should uh, take responsibility for certain things, but there are a lot of things we have to let go of and accept that we're not in charge. And parenting just seemed to be full of those I'm not in charge opportunities for letting go. And this begs the age-old question of just what or who is in charge. Some days it can feel like absolutely nothing in a confusing field of chaos. 
But most of the time, most of us are guided by some natural order or higher power or maybe just some formless organizing principle of life. Eileen Flanagan. You know, it's interesting. I feel like the further along my journey I go, the less I try and speculate about God. Um, But I would say that I I believe in a creator, in a divine force that we co-create with. So it's not that there's some old white guy on a cloud who's mapped it all out and these are the things Eileen needs to learn. So let's give her these lessons. Um, But I do believe in a greater spiritual force that we are kind of dancing with and that opportunities are presented to us and then we get to make a choice about what we're going to do with them. Am I going to be gracious in that moment when I'm being given a patience lesson or am I going to not be? And how are you doing? How am I doing? Um, in some ways, I feel like I've gotten much better in patience, but in in other times, you know, I remember that it's it's still not my natural strong suit. I think that with teenagers, understanding a little bit more of the pattern of growth has has helped me kind of weather some of that of realizing like, oh, this is a developmental stage you know, where they want to be independent and make their own decisions. I find that helpful to not take it personally, which I think I did when they were younger. I took it personally if they didn't eat their peas when they were supposed to. So how did you get past that? Because I think that's a very common kind of perception. I guess just experience um, and hearing the wisdom of other parents, you know, people who have raised children successfully, who kind of have that perspective, you know, because I think when you're in the midst of a parenting dilemma, it can seem so all important. And to talk to someone who's a few years ahead of you in the stages can be really helpful. This kind of essential support for parents traditionally came from extended families who may have lived under the same roof or in close-knit communities. Time-tested wisdom about child-rearing was naturally passed to the next generation of parents. And in today's typically more fragmented society, it's natural for parents to seek out guidance in the many judgment calls of raising the kids. Eileen Flanagan. I remember friends of my husband's in particular, whose children are grown now, that when we would get together with them over the holidays, of always just feeling... They have such a lovely family and um, always seem to have words of wisdom. And the main thing I remember Ginny saying, the, the mother, was just to just love them. Just love them. I was like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, we get so focused on are they doing this the right way or, or what have you. Um, and certainly, you know, there's some parenting practices, I'm sure, that are better than others. But remembering that it's about creating a loving atmosphere for for them to grow up is helpful. There's something beautiful in the way that a young child just gets totally absorbed in something that we might take for granted otherwise uh, that it kind of can bring bring you right back to uh, to what it's all about. I just have this hilarious memory of my son was a toddler. He was very young and he and his friend had spilt their juice or something all on the dining room floor. And I had read this parenting concept of natural consequences that you don't punish a kid for doing something, but you make them deal with the consequence of what they did. So I was like, okay, you guys were careless. So now you wipe up what you spilled. And I gave them two rags. And I, they were so young, but their, uh, his older sister was obsessed with Annie at the time. So they got down on their hands and knees and they started singing, It's a Hard Knock Life. <laughs> It was so funny, and they were so into wiping up the juice. They just did it with vigor, and, you know, of course, I was like, well, you spilled juice, but everything at that age is kind of an opportunity for learning and exploring. And they can turn it into fun. Exactly. It's a hard 
knock life for us is the hard knock life for us. Century and we get tricks. Santa says we get tricks. It's the hard knock life. You said that when your own children were babies, that you loved and identified with them so strongly that it made it easier for you to identify with others as well. Hmm. Can you describe that? Well, I think about things like natural disasters or wars or the violence that we've been hearing in the news. And there is something about the vulnerability of knowing that your child could be taken from you that for me, opened up a kind of compassion. And I, I'll look at mothers in other places or in other situations that are different from mine. I can't imagine what they're going through in one way, but in another way I can imagine, you know, just the horror of having your kid not come home or not knowing where they are or feeling that something, you know, bad has happened to them. Um, so I think it can be a way of sort of opening up compassion. Seeing the lives of other people's children as kind of everybody's children? Yeah, in a way. I mean, we're all part of the same human family, right? Yeah, we're all connected. So can you open that up a little bit, how the the kind of unconditional compassion that a mother typically feels for a young child can transfer to a deeper awareness of, you know, in a sense, we're all God's children mm -hmm. and how that can can allow a person to be more generous and be more inclusive. I, yeah, I think it can go either way, right? I mean, some people get focused on their own children to the exclusion of other people. I want what's best for my kids, so I'm going to focus on certain kinds of policies that are going to be good for us and not for other people. Um, sometimes I think it can be an excuse, but I think it can work the other way as well. Uh, when you see a child from any culture, or any country or any race or any background, that child is so full of hope and promise and we're all born with that. So for, for my situation being in Philadelphia where the public schools are so underfunded and um, just realizing that so many kids go to school in situations that are violent or, you know, not enough teachers, no art. Um, so it makes me care about that issue in a different way. We're talking with Quaker author Eileen Flanagan in Philadelphia. She's written on the spiritual lessons gained from parenting in a powerful essay, God Raising Us. Her books include The Wisdom to Know the Difference and Renewable, One Woman's Search for Simplicity, Faithfulness, and Hope. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. To learn more about Eileen Flanagan and to obtain an audio download or CD of this segment, Parenting as a Path, please visit us at humanmedia.org. Parents naturally seek to foster a home life where children feel supported and sustained as they set out on the complicated journey of making their way in this world. So that even when kids need an occasional course correction, they can rely on a safe foundation of enduring parental love. Eileen Flanagan. I certainly wouldn't say I'm a perfect mother or a perfect parent, and there are certainly times I got aggravated with them. But the love isn't conditional. You know, it's not like I can imagine a thing that they might do that I would stop loving them. I can't imagine that. Um, and I do in my family history know, you know, of people who've been excluded from the family because they didn't, you know, go to the right church or marry the right person or that sort of thing. But personally, I can't imagine 
even if my kids did something really horrible, I can't imagine that I would stop loving them. The primal experience of a mother's deep, instinctive love for her child is a remarkable dimension of human life found in every culture. And that universal truth can remind us to keep open the heart, a way of seeing other people with generosity of spirit, with tolerance, with forgiveness, including forgiveness of ourselves when we fall short. I think it comes back to the thing about humility, um, because I, before I was a parent, I believed that we should treat everyone generously. Before I was a parent, I had kind of high ideals about such things, and realizing how I could be short-tempered actually made me then more compassionate toward other people. Knowing that I could uh, get really upset about something silly, like my son drawing on the white carpet with the pink sidewalk chalk <laughs> or red, you know, making the, the carpet pink, you know, is really not an important thing. And I just like wanted to have my head explode in that moment. And then you see somebody else, whether it's road rage or the cranky teller in the grocery store or anything. I don't know what that person's been through. I'm much less likely to judge people, I think, for for being grumpy and I'm and in the bigger scheme of things I'm really aware of how cushy I have it. I've never been through war. I've never been through real real deprivation. I've been through sleep deprivation and that was so hard. Oh my gosh. You know, and at, so at the hands of a of at a the little hands one. of little ones who didn't want to go to sleep. I've been through sleep deprivation, but I've never not had enough food. I've never not had enough of the basics that I needed. So there is something about it that that makes me less judgmental of other people. At one point, you had kind of an intuition while trying to control and change your daughter, who was then very young, and you realized you should focus on changing yourself. That seems like a huge lesson. Can, can you explain that? Yeah, I had gone to the bookstore looking for a book on sibling rivalry because my kids were fighting all the time. And so I wanted to fix it. I wanted to make them stop it. And uh, I looked through all these books, and it was coming out of the bookstore. Um, I hadn't found the right thing. I just really felt this inner message of don't try and fix them. Fix yourself. And it was about being more patient and more loving and more kind and knowing that my children will learn from that. It doesn't mean that they won't get annoyed with each other. Um, but one, they'll learn from my behavior. And two, if I'm centered and loving and kind, I'll be much better off dealing with their squabbles. The most even-keeled parent inevitably gets knocked off-center sometimes. Kids can get cranky and teary. Their frustrations and tensions can build up and boil over and melt down, which in turn can fray the nerves of normally well-composed mothers and fathers. I remember I was reading uh, Thich Nhat Hanh's book on anger. The Buddhist monk the from Buddhist. Vietnam. Yes, that's correct. And he says that if someone is making you angry, probably they need compassion. And I came home with my son, and I, I can't remember what he was doing, but I remember that he was making me so angry that I went into the bathroom. So, like, I need a second, because <laughs> otherwise I'm going to yell. And I went into the bathroom, and Thich Nhat Hanh's words just came back to me. My son needs compassion. And it was true. He was tired. He was cranky. Whatever it was that was making him get on my nerves, it was fundamentally, you know, that he was suffering. And as soon as I had that thought, I was like, okay. And so I came out of the bathroom in compassion mode rather than would you stop screaming mode. And immediately the dynamic changed. He calmed down? He calmed down. Right after I calm down. Funny how that happens. <laughs>
Well, that seems pretty huge, actually, mm -hmm. because people in our lives kind of mirror where we are at because we're seeing them through the, through the lens of our perception. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it kind of plays itself out that way. How do you translate that in, in your life, in your daily life? I often need reminders. So Thich Nhat Hanh was a reminder. Uh, you just reminded me of another incident when my my son was young. My son is very energetic, and now he's an athlete, and it's wonderful to watch him as a teenager channeling his great energy. Uh, but when he was two or three, he channeled his energy in ways that were not always to my liking. And one was we were invited to a fancy party where there were nice tables out on a big wraparound porch. And he was wearing this cute little suit. And he jumped down and started throwing um, pebbles at the host's car. So I was like, oh my gosh, you know, so I run after him and I get him up. And the friend who I was sitting next to reminded me that when he was born, there had been a number of health concerns. He had had to spend a week in the intensive care unit. And she said, isn't it great that he's so healthy now? And I was like, yeah, isn't it great that he's so healthy? And it was a Saturday, and the next day I went to Quaker meeting for worship. And I was sitting in silence when those words came back to me. Isn't it great? that he's so healthy, that he can throw rocks at cars. You know, it's, there's so many things that you can say two different ways, and it just hit me in that quiet. Of course it's great that he's healthy enough to throw rocks at cars, um, but it's in the rushing of every day that we don't always see that. I just want to clarify, you're not condoning the throwing of not, rocks at cars. No, not, not at all. Um, more, more just having the big picture perspective as a parent. Parents trying to walk a spiritual path can easily find that the demands of a family can leave one precious commodity in short supply, downtime needed to process the events and feelings of life. When raising children, a parent's self-reflection is an essential ingredient in the practice of self-care. Well, when they were very young, taking walks was absolutely crucial to my mental health. Um, so put the baby in a stroller and walk outside as much of the year as I could get away with it. Um, it got a little harder when there were two of them and they wouldn't always want to be on the same schedule, you know, in the double stroller. Um, but for me, time outside really, really helps being near trees. And we should add you live in the city. You're not in a rural area. That's correct. That's correct. But in Philadelphia, we have lots of beautiful parks and neighborhoods. Um, William Penn's green country town. That's right. That's right. Going to Quaker meeting was important, and it was one of the benefits, actually, of having a two-religion family is that my husband and I would trade. So I got to have my kids in my faith community with me, but I also got every other week, you know, of quiet. Um, trying to journal, which I have not kept up as well as I'd like, but, but often when I'm in a period of frustration, that's really, really helpful. And then finding community, having other people who you can talk to who have similar values. You've written about the experience of holding other parents in prayer, mm. a way of showing them support and also the experience of being held by others in prayer. Quakers have that beautiful phrase, holding someone in the light. Mm -hmm. What's that like for you? It's hard to describe. Being held in the light, I can say I often have an experience of just being very grounded. And it can be in all kinds of things. Um, lately, I've been experiencing it where I've been doing a lot of public speaking, and I notice that if I've asked someone to hold me in the light or hold me in prayer, or if right before I speak I sit down 
and have a, a few minutes of silent worship with someone, it just seems like I know what to say much more easily sometimes. Um, You're kind of better prepared. Your consciousness or is available. Or something, yeah. Maybe open to divine wisdom. I'm not quite sure how it all works. But, but I do believe that it works. That's my experience. You know, in that moment when the kid is driving you crazy or you don't have enough time to do what you were going to do or whatever, we can feel really alone. And knowing that other parents have exactly the same kinds of struggles and that you're thinking of each other, but that practice of holding someone else in your heart, I think, makes us feel not alone and connected. Many parents turn to some form of prayer across religious boundaries the world over. And one of the most popular non-sectarian prayers in recent decades is the serenity prayer, widely attributed to the 20th century American theologian Reinhold Niebuhr. Eileen Flanagan wrote a book about that prayer, The Wisdom to Know the Difference. Well, the basic idea of the serenity prayer is that we need serenity to accept the things we cannot change, but we also need courage to change the things we can change. And it was that tension that I was really interested in exploring. People call it the serenity prayer because that's the first line, but it's not the only line. Um, It is the line that is emphasized the most in recovery programs, the accepting that you're an alcoholic or that you're a drug addict. Um, accepting your addiction is a way of facing the truth of it so that you can begin to do the other work on yourself that are involved in the steps. In accepting our imperfections, does it actually make it easier to address them? Oh, I, I think so. Sure. How can you How can you apologize for something if you don't want to admit that you hurt someone else? You know, um, how can you work on any problem until you're willing to see it. It's that great line of Jesus about, you know, why do you see the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and not the log in your own? I think that's such a challenge for us to to see our own imperfections and to admit them. But it's really key for any spiritual journey, whether it's recovery or any kind, I think. Eileen Flanagan, who wrote the essay on parenting, God raising us. Her books include The Wisdom to Know the Difference and Renewable, One Woman's Search for Simplicity, Faithfulness, and Hope. You're listening to Humankind. I'm David Freudberg. Studio recording by Alan Mattis. Editorial assistance from Ken Rogers, Kathy Graham, and Mark Kilstein. Webmaster Brian K. Johnson. Special thanks to Tony Buck. Our program is presented by Human Media in association with Connie Goldman Productions. Program development provided by Shart Media. To purchase a CD copy of this program, please call 1-800-5-LISTEN. That's 1-800-5-L-I-S-T-E-N. Or visit our website where you can also obtain an audio download of this and our other programs and can hear selected episodes free. You can access free written materials related to this program as well. Our web address is humanmedia.org. Again, if you'd like to purchase a CD copy of Humankind by phone, please call 1-800-5-LISTEN. And our web address is humanmedia.org. This segment, Parenting as a Path, is Humankind Program number 227. The executive producer is David Freudberg. This is Humankind. Greetings, friends. Bob Baldock here, wanting to let you know that KPFA's author events this fall are looking exceptionally compelling. Starting in September, we'll present Nicholas Scow, Greg Grandin, Ayesha Curry, Tracy Kidder, Amy Zyring, Chris Hedges, Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz, Ralph Nader, David Gantz with Blair Jackson, and Cleve Jones. We think they've each written terrific books. We're proud to be presenting them. We're grateful they want to appear for KPFA for you. Descriptions of each are on the KPFA website. The customary low price tickets will be available one month before each event. And yes, you heard that right. Ayesha Curry. Thank you.